Well, the Gonzaga Bulldogs finished off the non-conference gauntlet with a massive win over the number four ranked Alabama Crimson Tide. Is this team more prepared for March after this brutal stretch of games? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Well, it was a really, really fun morning on Saturday. Gonzaga Bulldogs, Alabama Crimson Tide in Birmingham, a very, very raucous crowd of primarily Alabama fans. Of course, the return game uh, when Gonzaga played Alabama in the battle in Seattle last year was a similar situation where Gonzaga was favored in that game. They had the home crowd on their back and Alabama pulled out a victory. The Zags gave it right back to them here a year later. Again, a top five team in Alabama, two victories over the number one overall team in the country. They beat North Carolina in the PKI. They beat Houston about a week later. Both teams ranked number one and the Zags came in and handed it to them. Ten point victory. Phenomenal, phenomenal performance. Drew Timmy deserves to be the first mention here 29 points 10 rebounds for drew 12 of 18 from the field he also had four assists it was just a textbook 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 performance from drew he was all over the floor good stuff on the defensive end wherever he got the basketball he seems to be able to make an impact good passing good scoring all of that good stuff for gonzaga we'll talk more about this in the final segment of the show but What we really saw in this game is this team's maturity and growth throughout the season. Something that I think we were waiting to see because they played this murderous stretch of games. And we we know the games. We know the contests. We saw them struggle against Michigan State. We saw them get boat raced by Texas. Response with the win over Kentucky. Of course, we also saw the loss to Purdue, the loss to Baylor, close game against Xavier. But what we hadn't really seen yet was, are these losses or are these tough games leading to something? Is this going to make the team better? And the expectation was always yes. The expectation was always, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you need to put young players through, players adjusting to new roles, et cetera, et cetera. But for a while, it didn't look like it was helping. It was hard to see the impact. They struggled with the Kent State squad that is good. Do not get me wrong. I am a a proponent of Kent State being a potential Sweet 16 team. That was a good squad, but they even struggled against UW, at least in the first part of that game. Uh, Heck, they had struggles against Northern Illinois at the time, a team that's outside the top 300 in Ken Palm, I think outside the top 325 for that squad. So the question was like, is, is this gauntlet, is this tough stretch of games really helping Gonzaga? And they looked like they were sort of limping into this game against Alabama. But what we saw for 40 minutes on the court in Birmingham was a team that is more mature, more poised, more prepared for tough road or pseudo road environments, challenging teams. Gonzaga got punched in the mouth multiple times in this game. They got punched in the mouth very early in the game by poor rebounding. They got punched later in the first half and they got punched really hard in the second half by Brandon Miller, just being an absolute dude in this game. And every single time Gonzaga absorbed the blows, they got back, they remained poised. Somebody hit a big shot. Somebody made a good defensive play and all of a sudden, bam, the six point lead or the eight point lead that evaporated that turned into a one point lead or a two point lead all of a sudden became an eight point lead became a 10 point lead and every time Alabama chipped away the Zags responded that is not the kind of thing that was happening earlier this year and that is what is critical that is what shows that this team is growing they are maturing they are evolving and I don't think that that stuff happens if these games are replaced with Northern Arizona 
or Merrimack or Bellarmine, not trying to crap on those schools, but you understand what I mean. This is the kind of game, these are the type of games that Gonzaga gets better from. And today, or excuse me, Saturday on that court, that is that was the evidence. That was the proof that this team is getting better. The Zag shot 57% from the field, 57%. They were 41% from deep. They were three from 11 in the first half on threes. They finished seven for 17. That means they went four of six in the second half from beyond the arc in this game. Just absolute lights out shooting. We mentioned Drew Timmy. We also have to mention his front court mate, one of the most underrepresented, underappreciated players in Gonzaga basketball history. I will stand by that. Of course, he is starting to get a lot more accolades lately. That is senior forward Anton Watson, 17 points, five rebounds, three steals, and two assists in this contest. He was 7 of 13 from the field. Alabama very clearly came into this game with the intention of, hey, we're not really going to guard Anton Watson. That's a bit extreme, but they were they were sagging way off of him, which is understandable considering his lack of an outside shot. But there were many opportunities where he just had free reign to get to the basket, and he took full advantage. That confidence that he has in himself, that the staff has in him, that his teammates have in him, has, has paid off massively this season in what he has been able to do. Drew Timmy, Anton Watson combining for 40, what is, I guess it would be 47 points in this game. Remarkable, remarkable performance from those two guys. Uh, the, the officiating in this game was another thing that I wanted to mention briefly. It wasn't good. <laughs> it, was, it was poor officiating. I, I don't think it was horrifically uneven. Gonzaga got called for a lot more fouls than Alabama got called for. And I think that a lot of them were ticky tack. I don't think that there were a lot of situations where Gonzaga was getting mauled and the fouls weren't getting called. I just think they called a lot more of the ticky tack fouls on the Zags. Of course, down the stretch, there was a lot of pretty bad calls that I think went against Alabama. When you can officiate a 40 minute basketball game and piss off every single person who watched the game, you probably just didn't do a great job. I don't tend to spend a lot of time on officiating in this game, but this was a borderline perfect game, not just for the Zags. It was just a great game of basketball. 100 to 90 in college basketball doesn't happen all that often. It was shot making after shot making after shot making. And it felt like a lot of the ways the, the refs almost took away from that in significant ways. A lot of ticky tack fouls, a lot of times that good offensive plays were ruined by either phantom offensive charges or bad defensive fouls just kind of a frustrating way for for what was an otherwise basically perfect game of basketball to watch on a Saturday morning in December it was kind of frustrating to see that kind of be one of the storylines that came out of this game but I can't imagine that you know by the time we're listening to this podcast that we're all that concerned about how the officiating was because the Zags pulling out a victory they now have two wins by double digits over Two of the best teams in the SEC, quite possibly the two best teams in the SEC, a good, solid basketball conference. And the Zags went out and beat both those teams. Neither were home games. Of course, the Spokane Arena was a pseudo home game for the Zags. This game was a pseudo road game, though, for Gonzaga, for them to travel all the way to Birmingham and take it to Nate Oates and the Crimson Tide. Again, it was poetic tying it towards what happened last year at the battle in Seattle for Gonzaga to basically return the favor here. I hope we see this series continue. I don't know if these two staffs are going to put it together or not, but man, another home and home, this time a true one at the kennel at Alabama's home stadium. I would love to see that. I think these two teams play some fantastic basketball and I sincerely hope that they can continue this series because it's a great game for the Zags. And quite frankly, it's a good game for an up and coming, very strong Alabama Crimson Tide program as well. But we're not done recapping this game. There is so much to talk about. It's the best game, the most fun game of the season for the Bulldogs. Coming up, we're going to look at my keys to the game, including Brandon Miller's dominance. we got to talk about that. We're going to talk about Gonzaga's bench production as well. But before we do that, I want to tell you all about LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people to hire for your team faster and for free. It's extremely simple to use. Start by adding your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. 
LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags. I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, taking a look at my five keys to the game that were presented on Thursday's episode of Locked on Zags. These were the things that I thought Gonzaga needed to do well in order to secure a victory. Let's take a look at how they did the first one, Swarm Brandon Miller. I specifically talked about on Thursday's show that trying to limit him is going to be the key to success for the Zags. Well, <laughs> quite frankly, they didn't do that. He didn't have a great first half. He only had 10 points in the first half. and In fact, he had six points at the first media timeout, only scored four points for the next 16 minutes of the first half. It looked like, hey, you know what? Gonzaga is stopping Brandon Miller. They're leading at halftime. This was clearly the recipe for success. Well, <laughs> Brandon Miller decided that one, one not-so-great half of basketball was good enough for him. He came out and went nuclear in the second half. This guy is so, so good. They compared him to Kevin Durant on the broadcast, and that is an extreme comparison. They even acknowledged that it was a bit of an extreme comparison. But when you're six foot nine, when you're that fluid with the basketball, when you can score from the three-point line, from beyond the three-point line, at times from well beyond the three-point line, just a ridiculous game from him. He had 36 points. He also had six rebounds. He also had six turnovers, but again, in a really high-paced game with a ton of possessions, Six turnovers from your star player. Drew Timmy, for example, also had six turnovers in this game. Uh, just a tremendous performance from Brandon Miller. The Zags effectively opted to do the opposite of what I ex- uh, expressed here, which is stop everybody else. Brandon Miller's be- going to get his buckets, and he did. And they tried. They tried to stop Brandon Miller. I don't think it was a lack of defensive effort. He just hit really big shots because he's an incredible shot maker. But there was nobody else on Alabama who really stepped up. Noah Clowney had a good game, but was a bit inconsistent. Mark Sears got a lot of open looks from three that he didn't knock down. That is unusual for him. Came into the game with 43% three-point shooter. So for the Zags, it was really a matter of, A, outscoring your opponent. Most of the time when you score 100 points, you don't lose. And that was a big part of the game here for Gonzaga. But also making other players for Alabama beat them. And they just weren't able to do that. Brandon Miller unreal in the second half, but it never really mattered. Sure, they got close, and Brandon Miller brought that game within two, within three, within one, uh, but ultimately Gonzaga managed to continue to to fight through that and still secure the victory. The other key, another one that Gonzaga didn't actually win here, and that was crashing the glass. The Zags got absolutely boat raced early in this game on the defensive glass. I think Alabama had two offensive rebounds on the first possession of the game. They had a third offensive rebound within the first minute and a half of the game. It looked really ugly. Gonzaga was getting out-rebounded badly badly early in the game you could see they wanted to get out in transition they wanted this to be a high possession high scoring affair it of course ended up being that but early in the game Gonzaga was so focused on trying to get out and go that they weren't effectively crashing the glass Alabama's got dudes they have size they have physicality they have athleticism so they were able to crash the glass really effectively it was a 25 to 18 advantage for the Crimson Tide at halftime. The Zags did better in the, you know, the, the latter part of the first half after really getting out-rebounded early. And then the second half was a tie, 12 to 12, which is remarkable. 25 to 18 was the rebounding in the first half. There was the same, there was less rebounds in the second half total than Alabama had in the first half. That's how on fire these two teams were in the second half of this game. Alabama still finished with a 7 Rebound advantage, 37 to 30. But for the Zags to tie that in the second half, have the same number of rebounds was a key factor in them building and maintaining their lead that they kept throughout the second half of this contest. Number three ended up being the biggest key of the game, the turnover battle. This was monumental for Gonzaga. When you talk about this team's growth and this team's poise and experience as the season has gone on, this is the example. They had three turnovers at halftime. 
I know that it was not a true road game, but if you watch that game, by golly, it was basically a road game. That Alabama crowd was loud. They were boisterous. They were yelling at Drew Timmy the whole game long. It was a very, very intense road road-esque environment for the Zags to battle through for them to only have three turnovers at halftime. Also, Alabama had 14, 14 to three was the turnover battle to in the first half of this game. That is how Gonzaga built that lead. That is how Gonzaga managed to survive Alabama having a really, really strong first half. And even in the second half, yeah, it got a little bit worse in the second half, but you know what the game finished? 21 to nine. 21 to nine was the finish of this game. So Alabama had only seven turnovers in the second half, but the Zags only had six. So the Zags won both halves in the turnover battle. They dominated in the first half. They maintained in the second half. Malachi Smith, big part of that. We'll talk about him more later, but he had five steals in this contest. Hunter Salas took charges. The whole team really stepped up. We saw Bama make some mistakes, make some bad passes, try to do a little bit too much. But by and large, it was Gonzaga's defensive intensity that forced Bama into turning the basketball over. And then their really, really strong performance offensively. Nolan Hickman, in particular, in terms of the, the turnover battle, he was phenomenal. He, he found the spot, the soft spot in Alabama's defense, that little floater. He hit it on multiple straight possessions. He was just so efficient and effective with the basketball. We were starting to see him turn into the player that so many people knew that he could or would become. The fact that it's already happening now, the fact that he showed it in a with a monster performance here against a really good Alabama team is proof that he is going to be ready to absolutely roll as this team gets into conference play for them to win a turnover battle the way that they did did 21 to nine in this game is a testament to how hard this team has worked to clean up the issues that really plagued them early in the season. Next up, big key for this game was the performances of Gonzaga's secondary scorers, Julian Strother and Rasir Bolton. And quite frankly, neither of them had great performances. Neither were awful. Strother had a really nice start to the game. He had six points, or excuse me, had four points on two of three shooting really early in the game. Uh, Picked up some fouls that kind of limited him in the first half. Only ended up with six points at halftime. Finished the game with 11 points and two rebounds. We didn't see much of him in the second half. Part of that was foul trouble. It's also possible. uh, As I'm recording this, I haven't heard anything definitively, but he was pretty sick with the flu on Monday. Seeing him not play much in the second half of this game leads me to believe that possibility there's a possibility there was some fatigue there. There was some some still lingering illness uh, for, for Strother, but a big part of it was just the fact that Malachi Smith played really, really well. And at the end of the day, with with Anton Watson playing the way he did, with Malachi Smith playing the way he did, it it was possible that they just went with different lineup situations that kind of more fit what they needed in this game. But still, was not a bad performance from Julian Strother. He just didn't play that many minutes. Rasir Bolton, it was really nice to see him be more aggressive. This is something we haven't seen from him a lot this year as he's kind of adjusting to what doesn't appear outwardly to be that different of a role, but perhaps he's being asked to do things a little bit differently. There was a couple situations where Alabama went under screens on Bolton and he immediately pulled open threes, exactly what he should be doing. He didn't, he wasn't super efficient in this one. He finished with 11 points, same as Strother. He also had four of 11 shooting. So again, not a particularly great game from Rasir Bolton, but I think he took the right shots. I think he, he passed at the right time. He shot at the right time. He played good defense. Uh, the shots just weren't falling. That's the kind of stuff that's going to change. As the season goes on, I'm not overly concerned about Rasir Bolton not finding the touch later on in the year. I, I think he just he took good shots. Some of them didn't go down. That happens. And then the final key in this game was bench production. And man, what, what a performance from Gonzaga's bench. For them to have stepped up the way that they did in Gonzaga's last three games against Kent State, against Washington, against Northern Illinois. We saw different bench players really step up. Hunter Salas was phenomenal in that stretch. Malachi Smith, really nice in that Northern Illinois game. Of course, Ben Gregg had a career-high 18 in that one as well. Greg and Salas weren't as impactful in this game. Hunter got some ticky-tack fouls called on him again. We kind of alluded to the officiating early in the quarter or early in the podcast, and that was one of those things that it hurt Strother, it hurt Hunter Salas, it hurt a few other guys uh, just in terms of them not getting to play as many minutes as they might have played otherwise. I thought Salas played a phenomenal game. He, it's not going to show up in the box score. That's often the case with Hunter Salas, but a nice performance from him when he was on the floor. Ben Gregg didn't play in the second half, as far as I can remember. Uh, He played a little bit in the first half, had a really nice stretch where he hit a three, came down on defense, stripped the ball away from an Alabama player, and then knocked it off their foot to get a turnover and give the ball back to the Zags. It was one of my favorite sequences of the entire game for Ben Gregg, another kind of testament to his growth 
and his maturity as he kind of steps finally into a consistent role on this team uh, in his third season at Gonzaga, although he is a sophomore. And then Malachi Smith. My goodness, Malachi Smith, what a performance from him. 12 points, five of six shooting for Malachi, five steals as well, four rebounds, big key for him, only one turnover in this game. There have been questions about whether Malachi Smith could play well against teams that were not North Florida or Northern Illinois. He did it against Baylor. He did it again here. I'm not sure those questions need to crop up anymore. Malachi Smith is that dude. He's a pure pure outside shooter. He is a good defensive player. He's a physical player. He can knock the ball away from you. He can hit outside shots. He makes good decisions with the basketball. He has been a revelation for the Zags the last few games and is going to be a big part of what they do as we get into conference play, which is what I want to talk about here in the third and final segment. The Gonzaga is officially through the gauntlet of their non-conference. They still have a few more non-conference games coming up before they get into conference play on New Year's Eve. We're going to talk about what we have learned from each of these big, huge non-conference games and how that is going to help this team in March. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. College basketball is back in action. The NBA is in the middle of their season, of course. College football bowl games are starting, and the NFL is getting closer to the playoffs. All of that means that betonline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all of the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, segment three, so many patents still locked on Zags, and we're going to reflect. We're going to reflect here in the final segment of the show because Gonzaga is done with the ridiculous stretch of basketball. We knew it. We looked at the calendar. We said November 11th versus Michigan State, December 17th versus Alabama. In that period of time, this team is going to get worked. They're going to play really, really tough games. They did. They survived it. As we are having this conversation, this team is 9-3. and three. I think a lot of people would take that, should have taken that. We kind of discussed preseason, like, Two losses, three losses, what's that going to look like? Of course, two of those losses were of the blowout variety, which I know is not something that Gonzaga fans are particularly used to. One of them coming very early in the season kind of set a negative tone going into the rest of Gonzaga's non-conference schedule. But by and large, this has been this has been a successful non-conference season. I don't think there's really any other way to look at it with the maturity and the growth that we saw on Saturday's game. If we hadn't seen that, we might be having a very different conversation right now. What I want to do here is really look at each of these games and kind of what, what did Gonzaga learn? What have they taken with them? What things did they learn in early games that they used against Alabama and what things might they use going into the conference play? And of course the big story, what are they going to use in March? What of this stuff that they have learned is going to help them in March become a team that maybe doesn't just make the Sweet 16? Maybe they go to the Elite Eight. Maybe they go to the Final Four. Some of the teams that they might face in those Elite Eight Final Four matchups, they've already played them. And that is a really nice advantage to have when you are getting into March Madness. So we'll go through these big games one by one. First up, Michigan State. The big lesson in the Michigan State game outside of, hey, playing on an aircraft carrier is hard. We knew that already, but boy, did that show up in that game. The big lesson in that game is that Drew Timmy is just so critical, so critical. Gonzaga figured out, hey, we're just going to get Drew Timmy the ball wherever we can get him the basketball, and we're just going to let him go to work. So that was an important lesson for Gonzaga to learn because they utilized that at other points this season where they just said, okay, nothing else is working, so just get Drew the ball. doesn't matter where, doesn't matter when, get him the basketball. Against Texas, the big thing that Gonzaga learned, there's a couple true things that they learned. One, their defensive rotations were bad. We knew that they were going to have some issues with preventing players from getting to the rim and, and making the correct read and rotation. A lot of those issues were curbed last year by the appearance of Chet Holmgren, who could erase a lot of Gonzaga's mistakes defensively. The Texas game showed us that, hey, he's not here anymore. He's not here anymore. And if you let Gonzaga, or if you let other teams guard, especially good guards like the ones Texas have, if you let them get around you, they're going to score, and it's going to be an issue. Of course, Gonzaga also learned how hard true road games are. Not that they didn't already know that, but, man, the Moody Center was absolutely popping off 
for the Longhorns in that one. And then I think the other big lesson in the Texas game was Gonzaga needs to learn how to not be so reliant on their transition offense. Again, I think not having Chet Holmgren, not having Andrew Nembhard really makes getting out in transition a lot more difficult for the Zags. And they were still early in the year trying to figure out, okay, if we can't get out in transition as often, where's our offense going to come from? What can we do to kind of find ways to score? We saw that show up here in the Alabama game with some more creativity on offense and, of course, more ability to get out in transition. Next game was the Kentucky game, the big lesson for the Kentucky game. Anton Watson is more than just a good perimeter defensive player. He looked fantastic in that game against Kentucky. He played great defense on Oscar Shibway. He was also phenomenal offensively. Kentucky wasn't prepared for him to give them that level of offense, even against Alabama, you saw they didn't seem to be too concerned about guarding Anton, but because they saw what he could do in that game against Kentucky, he looked good against Purdue. He looked good against Xavier as well. But but seeing that in that Kentucky game, I think, helped them feel more confident about him stepping out and having a big game against Alabama. Of course, that Kentucky game as well, Strother and Bolton combined for 44. They haven't been extremely consistent this year. That has been a criticism. But we know when they're on, this team can beat just about anybody in the country. The main things we learned from the Purdue game and the Phil Knight Invitational, number one, Purdue's really freaking good at basketball. That was the main takeaway in that Purdue game. A team that began the season unranked was 24th when Gonzaga played them. Now they're number one, as we're having this conversation, number one team in the entire country. So I think that's the biggest takeaway. Other takeaways from that game, Ben Gregg. Ben Gregg was a huge takeaway in the Purdue game. He looked awesome. He played good defense on Zach Eady. He hit some big shots. Nice performance from Ben Gregg. Look what we have seen from him since then. Even moving on to the Xavier game. Another phenomenal performance for Ben Gregg against Xavier. That game was also a big, big game for Julian Strother. He had 23 in that one, including hitting a big pair of threes down the stretch. I think the other priority or the other thing we learned in the Xavier game was that you just can't get complacent. You cannot, and this is a big lesson in March, you cannot let off the gas regardless of if you have an 8, 10, 12, 15-point lead against a team that's ranked that's ranked in the top, barely in the top 20, a team that's not even ranked like Xavier. They're a top 40 team, but they were not ranked at the time. Gonzaga got a little complacent in the second half. Xavier came roaring back. Strother helped them put that team away, but that should have been a 12 point victory. Ended up being a four point victory. And more importantly, a big lesson for the Zags. Of course, then you have the Baylor game. Baylor, the big lesson for me in the Baylor game was, was confirmation that we so desperately needed, which was that Malachi Smith isn't just good against bad teams. Malachi Smith can play against Power 5 programs. He can play against elite Power 5 programs. He showed that in the Baylor game. The other lesson, which Gonzaga had already kind of learned earlier in the year, or at least probably knew going into the game, if a team can figure out how to stop Drew Timmy, they have a better chance of winning. Drew Timmy, nine points in the Baylor game. Gonzaga's other players just did not step up in a significant enough way for Gonzaga to be able to pull out a victory there. And, of course, the culmination of, of all of those challenging games was here against Alabama. We saw Nolan Hickman step up in a monstrous way. You cannot tell me that Nolan Hickman's early season struggles did not contribute to him stepping out and having a monster game against Alabama. These things are related. His performance in this game was a testament to how hard he has worked to erase some of the early season struggles that he had against really high quality opponents. Malachi Smith, second time in a row that he has balled out against a top 10, top 15 caliber team. Did it against Baylor, did it again here against Alabama. Of course, Hunter Salas's continued emergence as a star defensive player was a big lesson as well. And then the overall question, a question that is kind of on the minds of so many Gonzaga fans as we kind of get out of this section of the season is, was this helpful? Was it worth it? Did this help? Did this hurt? To me, I've made it quite clear already. I think this helped. Look at how much better Ben Gregg is than he was at the start of the season. Look at how much better Hunter Salas is at the start of the season. How about Malachi Smith? How about Nolan Hickman? Everybody has looked better. There, there are a few role players for Gonzaga, secondary scorers, Julian Strother, Rissier Bolton. The, the inconsistency that we've seen from them remains an issue for this team. But the bench stepping up the way that they have it is monumental. And, and I don't think that that happens. I don't think Ben Gregg looks like this if he doesn't get opportunities to play against Xavier or Purdue. Hunter Salas doesn't, 
isn't as good of a defensive player if he doesn't get chances to go against the very best guards in the country. Him getting to guard Brandon Miller, him getting to guard some of the other players that he has guarded in the last couple of games, uh, and certainly against some of these high-quality opponents, getting to play real minutes against LJ Cryer, Adam Flagler, and uh, Keontae George at Baylor, getting to play against Sevier Wheeler, Kaysen Wallace at Kentucky. like Him getting those opportunities, even though in some of those games it was not as much as we've seen him play lately, but getting those opportunities critical critical for him. I think that this schedule has overwhelmingly helped Gonzaga be a better basketball team. And I think I thought we wouldn't see that till March. We wouldn't know an answer to this question until March. I think we already see it. I think it's already there. I think this performance against Alabama proves that this team is in a much better spot. And yeah, it's one game. You don't want to take too much from one game, but seeing them play like this in a road-esque environment against a top five team in the country, to me, they're not at this stage in mid-December without the early season struggles. I would do this schedule 10 times out of 10 again if I could. And I'm guessing that Mark Few right now, shortly after that game is over, I bet he's feeling the exact same way. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Plenty more reaction coming to this game. We're also going to take a look at Gonzaga's next matchup against the Montana Grizzlies coming up later in the week. Uh, enjoy your weekend, Zags, or enjoy the rest of your week, Zags fans. Check out my new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. It's a national show all about college hoops with myself and co-host Isaac Shade. It is available wherever you get podcasts. It is also available on YouTube, so check it out there if you haven't done so yet. Finally, I want to thank all of you for making Locked on Zags your first listen of the day and remind you, as always, go Zags.